So I will uh, introduce our authors this evening in reverse order of the way they will be reading. Uh, so Shane McRae is the author of In the Language of My Captor, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and the William Carlos Williams Award. The Animal Too Big to Kill, winner of the 2014 Lexi Rudinsky Editor's Choice Award, Forgiveness, Forgiveness, Blood, and Mule. He is a recipient of a Whiting Writers Award and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. He teaches at Columbia University and lives in New York City. And reading first this evening, Francine J. Harris, my dear friend, uh, is the author of Play Dead, winner of the Lambda Literary and Audrey Lord Awards, and a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. Her first collection, Allegiance, was a finalist for the Kate Tufts Discovery and Penn Open Books Award. Originally from Detroit, she has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the McDowell Colony, and the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. She's an associate professor of English at the University of Houston. Please join me in using your uh, Zoom clap or heart or uh, party uh, <laughs> reactions to help me welcome uh, Shane and Francine to your living rooms. <laughs> I'm clapping for all of us. <clears throat> um, oh, yes, okay, I guess I'm just supposed to start. Um, okay, well, hi, everybody. Um, I'm so glad to be here. And this is a very awesome and special reading for me because um, I went to school in Ann Arbor and really miss Literati who, you know, by the way, not for nothing, but came in um, when we were in a book store desert after, you know, others had gone away the big other, and then we'd lost another one. And Literati really came in and like, just kind of saved our little um, book loving hearts. So I have a special place um, in me for Literati. I'm so glad to be reading with you and to be reading with Shane, who's like one of my favorite poets. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking. And thank you, John, for being with us, my dear friend, for getting us together. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I wanted to read um, a couple poems from the book. And then I wanted to, I think I'm gonna read one poem from Allegiance actually, um, and I'll tell you why. Okay, um, so here is The Sweet Hand is the newest collection that I'm very excited about, partly because of how beautiful it is. Um, this painting is by Shaniqua Gay, and um, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just really excited about how gorgeous the painting is and that it, it gets to be part of my life for now. Um, so anyway. <clears throat> Uh, Versal. The wood is not a Negro with tree in the farm split sand for almighty, not a road to bend over, not a lakeside or sideways log stump, not a sidelong, not a strangler clutch or fruiting body of fungus. The worn of wood is not hiding in bark, in deer suit or elk piss musk, not in camouflage, not a snowshoe, a Negro, not a cow hide stripped or oversprawl. The tree is not a loner type, not a sleeper cell, not a jumpy trigger. The foliage low hangs a lake I like, an ice cave shot, a hit tide frozen in place. And a black girl is standing on it, over a river rocking, side bank isn't thug among us, not a rush gang, not a flower snatched from sidewalks, which isn't breaking in root. Nothing for jewels, isn't watching through windows. The black meadow isn't sniper squatting, cheapening the reek, field reek. I saw a cattail driving down the sound of stream drive by. The wood is an eager, a negus among us, a runner like eagle, a brown sighting root system gathered and growl of curl of a mast vein feed. Say it with us. The wood is a falcon, a clean stretch of might. The dark bark is humming, night stretched. A reserve is craning in its path glow pitchfall, matted grass attriment, blowing night like long husk, and a black girl is standing in it. Um, I picked these poems 
like largely because um i don't know i feel like they kind of go with shane's poems um because i was reading his amazing new book and i was just thinking of some of the poems that well i guess i'm reading the poems that his book was making me think of so if you're wondering why i picked these poems i feel like there has to be a reason the fat of the fog hovers over a man who sits inside his canoe beached at the shore he sits inside it swaying the thick is so close only a few ducks swim visible the lake itself has vanished behind me traffic lights like helium as evening rolls forward and i wave because one figure is sketched inside the steam of another and down the beach geese lift a couple on a beach scatter inside their own gray mist earlier it was clear and warm i was on the phone for hours with a woman i keep getting it wrong with i tried telling her which fruit i cut too early the hard green pulp of avocado that won't yield its pit that i bike out of breath in warm months and how empty the dark buildings in the city glass on the floor what you could hear crunch and echo like voice but that's a story she knows everybody knows it instead i tell her i can't help but wait in the fog that cruelty waves back from his boat he gets out and wraps its skin like an ankle inside a ballerina's slipper he docks it on a squat dolly he walks toward me and drags the limp thing through the sand. Um, I'm going to interrupt this. Well, no, I'm not. Yes, I am. Because I, I don't, I don't know if I like, I don't know if this poem is good anymore. I haven't read it in so long, but I was thinking about it because of all the angels in, um, in Shane's new book. Um, <laughs> it's a, uh, He's got this, this interesting, like almost Dante-esque tr trilogy going on. So there's heaven happening in this new book. Um, and anyway, I was thinking about um, the title poem to the first book, um, which is called Allegiance. So it's a little long. Okay, Allegiance. An angel would, oh, by the way, it's about Detroit, specifically about Detroit. So also appropriate, east side of Detroit, okay. Um, an angel would have to have crooked teeth. This would indicate dental problems the family couldn't afford to fix. An angel would need to be familiar with Johnson and Johnson and cocoa butter, could explain the taste of powdered eggs. An angel would have to know when to shut the fuck up. An angel would not come drunk on vodka and would prefer gin filthy. It's hard to tell which angels know how to make chitlins, but a good angel would not mind you asking. An east side angel would know how to rig the gas meter without alerting DTE. An angel could pick a good wine from the orange price tags at the liquor store. A Detroit angel will know where to get a monthly bus card. A city angel will know where the river's current means jumping in is really suicide. A Detroit angel could tell you where you can use a public computer. An archangel could tell you where to find one all night. Any angel would bring a new lexicon. A city angel will, move, will mold a wall of years because there's too much bullshit for two. A Detroit angel would take all this loose religious fervor and build us a Jesus. An angel would let you take cuts. An east side angel would let you finish your sentence. Any angel will help you pack your shit when it's time to move. An angel will give you back your lost pen. An east side angel has a spot for you on their porch. Most angels can fuck. Some angels wear metal. An east side angel knows that girls like the taste of pillows, even if they don't talk about it. A Detroit angel will give you three feet of personal space at the bus stop. Any angel will call you first after your date. An angel will call you, often call you an angel. Too many angels smoke. Some angels let their body go. An angel put his weight on you. An angel limber in clouds. An angel will pick up the coat you dropped. An east side angel never asks you for cash. A Detroit angel has never had to use a gun. A city angel, something dark around the eyes. Shit talking, lunar mouthed angel. Crazy angel with a chipped bone limp. Bipolar angel with a snapped wing shoulder. Quiet angel, sit with you all night. 
an east side angel can read your mind. Narcissist angel, Icarus angel, lush angel picking its hair up off the floor. Screeching vocalist violet, improv dead horns overdose. Angels addicted to addict angels, needs a punch to feel it angel. No one hears the angel scream. An angel takes in the groceries, climbs the stairs. Bad knees angels, angels subtle. No one gets the subtle angel. Angels wear nightgowns stuck in their butts. Angels gray hair don't age them right. Angels black pool around the eyes. Angels mean suicide and it comes out shapes. Angels know how to fight off the cops. Angels offer you coffee, offer you coffee. Angels might have to take back everything they're giving you now. Angels bloody lip, angels bashed in heads. Angels never broke a bone, don't need stitches. Offer you coffee, offer you coffee. East side angels don't ever change, still look the same. East side angels, same address. East side angels on the sideline in case the blows are too bloody. Detroit angels stay close to home, close to mama. East side angels, gaps in their teeth. Detroit angels, wings stuck in Detroit. Angels pace their east side floor. Angels pack their wings and luggage. Angels lock their halos in emergency glass in case there's trouble. Um, and then I think I'll just read one more from the book um, and then call it a day. I kind of think about this poem as a bit of a prayer. It's kind of like a global warming prayer. So I like to say it every once in a while, considering there's hurricane season coming, seems a good time. Ablate the sun cups not the ice, an incantation. O oh God, the de sublime, allay the vertical penitents their limbs, rest them back cold, not in precipitate, but in seed, in potential of hydrogen. Spoon in density to be sung of their winter's need and soak. Sip pond to sun cups over sunrise, far from the flat dispatch of heat, its stench, its wayward ever summer barge and fallout. Jesus, be a river, be an untainted float of deliquescent surge, be saltless and cold. O oh, pose of hope, allay the waterfall, hear their prayer. O oh, bed of oxygen, divine surge, be also brackish sea, be seed of the frost and supercooled, be shade soup. Sweet hell of beloved drench and mitochondrial belly, be flint for the watery flame, douse out the eventual crunch the big scorch, the rip of our primordial anus, and mouth suckling at the place of eco-abundance. O oh, sweet bio teat, O oh, hygroscopic lordess, were we to sit still and let ourselves be cold for hours, wiped a web crack frost, mild sud of the slow glacier, rhymed vat at the edge of rash season, our legs from twitching. O oh, known keep of tomorrow, might we skill our motor pie, pedal from the crib of our await. O oh, stable evolver, an alms for safe passage, your earthen cooling, forgive us our erosion, heal the demanding snows. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> That's so funny. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, I think I just um, start going. I think that's how this works. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I'm really excited to read with Francine, who is one of my favorite poets and also um, someone uh, whose work I find uh, tremendously intimidating. Um, I also want to uh, thank um, John and, and, and Literati for having us. I'm going to read from my new book, um, which I think came out the same day as Francine's. Um, and um, I'm, I'm only going to read from a, a sequence of poems that are spoken by um, Jim Limber. He was in um, uh, another book of mine in the language of my captor. He's a historical figure. He was in the last year of the Civil War. He was informally adopted by Jefferson Davis and Barina Davis, Jefferson Davis's wife. Uh, Jim would have been about seven years old. He lived in the Davis family's home 
um, for a year um, until the end of the war when uh, Union soldiers uh, took him away from the Davis family. Um, after that, he sort of disappears from history. Um, all of these poems are spoken uh, from the afterlife um, with the caveat that the poems assume that a multiverse exists. And so Jim Limber inhabits um, a Malta heaven. Um, and so even though there is a sort of narrative line, each Jim Limber is a different Jim Limber in a different heaven at the end of a different life. Um, and I think that that's all y'all need to know. Oh, and they're all sonnets, except for one, um, which is spoken from Limbo. Uh, so this is, um, Jim Limber in heaven is a nexus at which the many heavens of the multiverse converge. I've been a long time dead without my life. And when it comes back, it comes back to me in parts and sometimes I get two or three, or I don't know how many, 15, 40 of the same part like I lived, the same life, 60 different ways I'll see my face and it's my same face. And I'll be standing where I remember standing once. And if other folks were there, they're there, or some of them or all of them. But me and some or all of them are wearing different outfits like the weather in us changed. I think now more than half of life is death, but I can't die enough for all the life I see. Skipping ahead a lot, and this is uh, Jim Limber describes his arrival in heaven. What was it like? It wasn't like the candle went out in my bedroom, and next I found myself in the sun outside. I felt myself, my body more so much I couldn't tell for sure if it was mine. I thought I was chasing a big dog through the tallest grass I'd ever seen, grass taller than the tall grass me and mama hid from the master in the night before the morning Mrs. Davis took me away. And somehow that dog stayed just an inch or two ahead. I was already dead and had been dead some time. Then all at once, I saw the grass it was giant wings. It was angel's wings whipping my hands and face. I think I'm so used to the Jim Limber story that it occurs to me there might've been a couple of details I left out. Um, how he came to be uh, a part of the Davis family was um, Verina Davis was returning home from shopping and she saw um, a, a black woman uh, beating a mixed race child and um, Verina Davis just sort of got out of her carriage, took the child home with her. Um, as I said, Limber disappears from history after uh, his year with the Davis family, and nobody really knows who the woman was, but my assumption has always been that she was his mother. This is uh, Jim Limber refuses to enter heaven until he has lived a happy life. I got to heaven, and I won't believe it, because nobody in heaven is going to make a fool of me. I told them, send me back if you're good angels like they got in heaven. I told them, send me back and I'll believe you when I wake up in good boots, since I never had good boots. I'm waiting on those good boots still. I'm waiting still for them to send me back. I'm waiting to wake up. I told them, and at first they smiled and said it slower like I hadn't heard, but now they just don't talk to me. I'm standing outside the gates and shouting, I ain't fooled. If I've earned my reward, where is the life where I can spend it? This is Jim Limber's theodicy, and that's one of those 25 cent words. And just in case you don't know, just like I didn't know before I looked it up some years ago, a, the a theodicy is essentially um, an argument uh, trying to. Uh, sort of defend God from the accusation, you know, um, I guess maybe a better way to say it would be explain the existence of evil in a world or a universe created by a good God. So that's what a theodicy is. What if it heaven was like my mama said it would be like gardens spread like blankets spread wide beneath rivers, gardens full like rivers with good food, all kinds, fish, but also okra fried hot and bread and chicken and even candy. 
all served on dishes like the dishes white folks got. What if it heaven was like what we laughed about over supper sometime? And we were here together now in heaven, and we saw it together, me and mama now, in heaven on a picnic between those rivers. What if in heaven we could have white things and not be white? How would we know how good it was if it was good for everyone? So the book is divided um, into multiple sections. Um, and in the first group of Jim Limber poems, Jim is sort of in, he's in heaven, but it's, it's, it's kind of a bummer version of heaven, if that makes sense. Um, and, and this is the, from the second half of uh, the book where um, it's a bit less of a bummer. Um, and this is uh, Jim Limber on the peace which passeth all understanding. First thing I saw that heartened me in heaven was a dead field first thing beyond the gates. I might have thought if I had seen it when I was still alive, a field in such a state, I might have wondered whether it had ever been cultivated, whether Negroes had worked it. And if I had, I might have wondered how many died before it got so bad. How many Negroes did it take for the field to die? The deaths of Negroes being the life and death of the earth. I might have asked the dirt. I might have asked the limp brown grass, but there was nothing human in the field. I had never seen that before, death with no people in it. This is Jim Limber in heaven, writes his name in water. You walk through heaven anywhere to anywhere on that soft green grass, or nowhere, it don't matter, anywhere you walk a bright and cool, and it's about a foot wide stream of the cleanest water anywhere with each step you take parts the grass beside you, on your left side, if you're left-handed, and on your right side otherwise. Just reach down if you're thirsty or you're dirty or you're hot. They got the sun in heaven still, and folks get hot sometimes. Me, sometimes I walk just to see the stream appear. Sometimes I lead it through my name. On earth, I couldn't spell my name. Now my great thirst has been revealed to me. I'm just going to read two more. Thank you all again for coming to this. Uh, this is Jim Limber tells what he knows about heaven. Heaven's a horse, a train, a ship with no captain or with a captain, but the captain is a Negro, or a rowboat tied but loosely to the dock, the river peaceful, nobody or everybody is a Negro. It's a hundred Negroes on the dock. A thousand Negroes, like when Jesus broke the bread to feed 10,000 people, maybe 15, and the bread just grew and grew. The dock just grows and grows beneath them. 10,000 Negroes cheering you to freedom. A 100,000, and you got good shoes and walk to the rowboat smiling and untie it. But heaven ain't you running, but you staying. And this, as I said, it's the only poem in which Jim is not in heaven. Um, he is in limber because it's a multiverse. Things can turn out a lot of different ways, but I had assumed Jim would be in heaven except for this one time. <clears throat> and this is uh, Jim Limber burning where no fire is. Such as I've been, I am, I never was bad or a good boy. Except as I was born bad, like, you know, the badness in a glass of fresh milk, if you leave it in the sun, will be exposed by the blazing inquiry. Bad like the sun won't make it fresher, not bad like a white boy's badness lights the sky with a strange second sun that dies unnaturally from the sky. That while it shines down on him, makes the ground he walks a stage, and when it dies, he is himself again. A living Negro never walked the stage. We are the ghosts of who comes after us, and their memorial I bet I was sent to limbo, because whoever watches wasn't sure what good and bad things I had done, but saw the good and bad things millions of Negroes had done before me on my back, and couldn't add the figures up, and thought limbo was good enough and not to darken heaven, darker than heaven has to be. 
or it might be a storm of Negroes in heaven. I bet whoever watches sees a storm of Negroes piled high, thrashing on my back. Whoever watches sees a pile of Negroes thinks they're thrashing because it's so many in one place, but the thrashing's all the rush of the eye from one black body to the next, and it's no thrashing in the bodies, but the wrong is in the eye. I bet whoever watches didn't see I had a storm of Negroes on my back, but it was a black cloud like the black clouds I've seen in the far heaven I've seen from limbo, like the clouds I've seen from which I've seen stars born, such storms as are the glory of the dark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, oh, awesome. That was really lovely. Um, I think having the task of asking you questions is difficult for me because I'm very intimidated by your work and um, conceptual. I'm also <laughs> intimidated, by the way. <laughs> so we're all intimidated. Great. It's great. Everybody's intimidated. Um, but we're, we're also, I also want to leave a lot of time for um, audience questions and we're getting some of those as well. So I just have a couple questions, I think, just sort of general ones and then we can move on with those audience questions. And please feel free to continue to submit um, audience uh, questions, you the audience as well. And I'm also dropping in the chat again, a link to where you can purchase books. Um, so Francine was reading an, an interview of yours from, from 2016 where you, where you mentioned um, a poet is interested in trying to reach the point where you understand and then pushing past that understanding. Um, and I'm thinking a lot recently about like, it's difficult not to, and I wanna avoid asking that sort of tried question of like, what is it like to release a, this book, these books um, in this particular time period, um, by which people often mean the pandemic, but of course, um, the uprisings that are happening, um, political strife, the Anthropocene, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it occurs to me that like um, things, the way we receive poetry is just a little bit different because we live in this very accelerated time. And it yeah. feels like things are accelerating very quickly. Um, and both of you write work that I think in this way forces a reader to slow down, um, both sort of structurally and sort of conceptually, um, both with um, whether that's the way uh, on, on the page, the language is being approached or, or broken up or with the, the project that one is uh, pursuing as a reader through um, Shane, your work. Um, and so I, I, my question is just more broadly, um, what has it been, uh, has it changed sort of your approach to like the post book period to 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 be in this sort of different time um, yeah. sort of like this isolated time but also this kind of like uh i, I don't know i don't know how to think of it other than like a hyper accelerated um period yeah or it seems like the reader has a different interaction now with the work than in sort of like the <laughs> veiled pre-pandemic times when we sort of lived in the this kind of like illusory normalcy I mean, it's so hard to know, right? Because like, you know, I keep thinking about, I don't know, I'm sure everybody thinks about this. I keep thinking about what's gonna happen when we all come back together <laughs> and start talking about, you know, I mean, there's, you know, the Twitter feeds, I guess, are one lens on this experience, but I also know that there must be a whole other experience that we're just, is just too nuanced for Twitter or whatever the Twitch, I don't know. <laughs> John mentioned Twitch earlier and I was like, God, what is Twitch? There's a whole nother realm of communication that I, I'm not aware of, whatever, anyway. But it's interesting to me because this book, you know, I pitched this, this book and, and of course that was happening in late last year and early this year, to coming up with ways to describe you know, what I was doing, why I wrote the book, et cetera. And I was describing it as, uh, 
solid is being about solitude and particularly as being about a kind of solitude that is particularly feminine and p particularly black um, but not but only in so far as um, I suppose that you know the way that you have a have a take on things because of because of that identity I suppose and then <laughs> the book comes out and like everybody's quarantined so <laughs> I don't know if that makes it more relevant or less relevant but it definitely is different than what I had envisioned you know what I mean like everybody's experiencing a kind of solitude right now so in a way it kind of makes it easier to convey some of the things that I was thinking about um but yeah I don't know that's that's one thought among a lot of thoughts I guess Are you wanting me to answer the same question? Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or I can ask a new one. It's up to you. I mean, my answer won't be anywhere near as good or interesting, um, but I, I'm perfectly happy to answer. Um, it, it, I mean, I, I guess um, maybe I can answer it thinking about certain, well, there are a couple ways to approach the answer. One is a sort of practical um, one is practical considerations. Um, I never, with any of my books, I've never done anything like a book tour or anything like that. I don't, I just can't, I can't you know, I can't leave my family that long. It, it would make me too unhappy. Um, and so, um, like for my first book, I didn't even do promotion at all. It's just not really a thing I do a lot. Um, and um, for this book, um, for the first time, I had lined up a group of visits to places um, and so, you know, like everyone else, I guess, um, that was a little weird to suddenly not, you know, have all these plans for what your life is going to be like, and it's not like that, but that's sort of what everybody's going through. And so, um, but for me, maybe it's a little different because I'd never done that before. And so I'm sort of used to not doing it. And so it didn't feel, I, I expect for a lot of other people, it feels even bigger. Um, uh, I guess, um, the other thing I would say is, um, I mean, at least that's what it's like been been like relevant to COVID, relevant to various revolutions um, going on right now in the U.S. Um, it's a little weird because this was the book where I was like, I'm not going to do a political book because I've been doing like really heavy ones and the gilded auction block was like so specific and so heavy and so particular about um, its politics that I thought, I worried that there was a way in which that particularness was actually getting in the way. And I wanted to try to make a book that was just sort of about other things. I don't know what those things would be. And it sort of inevitably was not about that. By the time I got done with it and I saw what Limber was actually talking about, he's still talking about he's talking about all the stuff I'm kind of always talking about, but he's talking about it in a sort of different context, um, that there is a way in which power dynamics um, that uh, Limber had, would have dealt with his entire life are not escapable when he goes to heaven, because in order for them to be escapable by going to heaven, it would mean that heaven would have to profoundly change not only him, but everybody in heaven, but Christians at least tend to imagine heaven as a sort of continuation of the self without any worries. But one of the reasons we have worries is because of ourselves, because of the things that we all as a collective sort of do to each other. Um, you can't continue the self and yet lose all of the things that generate one's own worries and worries for other people. And so Limber, the Limber sequence is a sequence that sort of recognizes that if everybody's gonna be in some sense who they were on earth in heaven, then the pro some of the problems from Earth are going to be continued in heaven, which means it still ends up being political. So maybe I was thinking about that in that there's that one poem where you talk about the baby being grown in heaven. That's like, mm -hmm. sure. minute. I never thought about this before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I you know it's a thing. You always wonder what that what it's really you know because there are a lot of like theological these ideas that like if your baby dies you know, in infancy, when you go up to heaven, they'll just be there. But what does that mean? Like, you've got an eternity with this, like, inarticulate being that's just sort of like, do they grow up in heaven? And do they stop growing up at some point? It's like, yeah. I mean, 
I hadn't thought about it either, but then I wrote the poem. <laughs> Um, so, but I mean, oh, go ahead, Francine. Oh, I don't know. I just, you know, I'm so, I guess I, it probably goes without saying that I'm of the ilk that there is no political or apolitical. Everything has, has a politic, whether you yeah. admit to it or not. Um, and I suppose, I think the, what's, What's weirder in a way about writing like a few of the poems in my, in this book are aware of their politics in the sense that they say something very specific. They name certain people, um, they're tied to a certain time and place. And in a way, I don't know, I just, I just thought about this. In some ways it almost makes it less political because it only, um, it only speaks to that one thing, right? Like yeah. it only offers one thought about a very specific thing. And so, I don't know, I just, that's not about anything necessarily. It just, it almost like feels irrelevant in some ways. I've used that word a lot. <laughs> feels like a footnote to all of these larger, more important issues. Yeah. Um, like to my mind, I think to me, like the most, and I just thought about this, the most, the strongest political statement that I think I made in this book is I keep thinking about the line, there's a black girl standing in it. Like for mm -hmm. me, it's, it's more important than a lot of other things that I space specifically about the election or specific, do you know what I mean? Like, sure. so in a way, like, I feel like philosophy, like philosophical imagination can sometimes be more important, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I feel you, I feel you. I think I was thinking too, just about um, this, these stuff, this happens a lot in the book world where sort of these books are coming out and it's just sort of like a commercialization thing, but books that sort of, you mark now as like prescient or or timely or something like yeah. that and thinking about how that sort of um signals like i'm just thinking about these things for the first time <laughs> because i have to kind of uh right. so like for for many like the 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 reverberations of everything that's happening sort of like awaken people out of a kind of a sense of normalcy that they are privileged to be in whereas like labeling something as prescient or like you know, interesting for this moment or whatever, it seems to sort of signal like, you know, well, the, the work of this author, they've, it's not surprising to the author, you know, the, the work that they're doing, the things that they're discovering, the stuff that, that they're working in. Um, so yeah, that, I know it's sort of an inchoate question, but you both answered it so wonderfully, so thank you. Um, and my other question before I, we've got a lot of audience questions, so I wanna be able to get to them, is just about, um, talked about a little bit before we went live about about what you're both working on but also for Shane the sometimes I never suffered um you write in the preface sort of concludes this um sequence of poems mm -hmm. and um did and he say concludes <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it, did he say concludes <laughs> I did I know say you said it was, I it was a continuation. I yeah, I said concludes. I did. Oh, okay. Well, I just, I guess this is a question about like for poets who, who we both have, you know, many books now and navigating through um, that space is different than having N minus one book, I would imagine. And so I'm wondering what it's like to. Um, like what affordances that gives you and what you want to write and what things you're ready to pursue writing or um, if it's like difficult to try to shake a, a voice of an older book or series of poems or something like that um, and how you like what that forking process is like after, now that there's like many you know iterations of, of you writing book um, yeah. yeah like how, how does it shape the writing process essentially I mean, I, it's a couple things. Um, so, you know, I, I always worry um, that my books are going to be boring because they're going to sound like each other and people are going to be sick of them. Of course, that assumes too much. It assumes that people have read any of them. Um, and, but it also <laughs> assumes that people would read like more than one, which I, I can't 
that's obviously not correct, but nonetheless, if I'm a reader, you know. Um, and so after this uh, book, um, I mean, what I'm doing now, I guess, is I'm trying to write poems that have very limited amount of punctuation marks in them, which before this, um, none of my books, except for there's a verse drama in this book that has some punctuation in it and in the language of my captor, there's a prose part that has punctuation. But I'm trying to write like just my regular old poems, but punctuate them. And it's very difficult and weird. Um, and you lose some things and you gain some things. Um, and so I feel like having completed what I think of as a sort of weirdly epic thing, um, or at least a, a failed attempt at doing an epic, having finished that, I've got some freedom to do other things. Um, and you know, there's a memoir that I'm, I'm working on and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but, and so that's, I mean, it's just practically speaking, sort of nice to feel like I have uh, a little bit of freedom. Um, the other thing though is I've been, it's been suggested to me more than once by more than one person um, that I should not write so much. And I also don't think one should write as much as I do. What and does that mean? I, who said that? People, you should go get plenty it. Plenty of people who said that. I just, I, and it, it's, it's weird haters. because- Haters, those are haters. <laughs> haters. I mean, I used to have this philosophy behind it and it's a stupid sounding philosophy, but what it was was, I, this sounds so stupid. Back when REM was a really good band, like when they were like the best band in the world, they did like an album a year, um, like in that, that stretch in the eighties. And I was like, well, if they can do an album a year, why can't I write a book a year? You know, I mean, that's, it's the, it's the thing that marks, you know, the book is the thing, like the album was the thing in the eighties. Um, and that's stupid, but also like, I, I need, I, I want to slow down a little bit, but I also don't, like, I just write as much as I want to and as much as makes me happy. And I write so much more than goes in the books. And there's so many poems that just never get finished or that aren't any good. I've got actual hundreds of poems that just aren't finished or aren't any good that I've written while I've written my books. Um, and so um, it's, it, it feels a little artificial and I had to figure out a way to, instead of like doing a book every year, do a book every five years, but it's like 600 pages long. So like, I've got to, got to figure out a way to change my pace a little. But your books talk to each other though. It's really interesting. I feel like um, maybe more so than other people I, I think of with multiple books, there's, they feel like chapters in something that I have yet to quite, that's yet to be complete. Like they feel like, I don't know, some of them, because some of them, and, and I, I suppose it's stylistic to some extent, but it's because it seems to be because you do something so different with, with every book, given how you think about Sejura, given how you think about repetition, like they all seem to kind of be treatments in a way. So I don't know, they talk to each other to me. Um, That's very nice of you to say. I'm not a nice I do try person. to do something. Oh, very nice. <laughs> I do try to do something uh, new with each book. I do try to do something yeah. that I haven't done that kind of freaks me out. Like with this one, it was the first drama. I, I try to do something that I just didn't think I could do and I still am convinced I can't because that helps me to write them, I guess. Oh, I guess, I'm, am I supposed well, to answer that? Because I don't a, have enough folks there, to answer that. There's, well, there's a question for you from the audience that I think could be like, a, a, yeah. a specify yeah. the follow-up for it. you. Which Let's is um, from Ray, our friend Ray McDaniel. A question Ray. for Francine. Hi, Ray. Um, this you is going to be a crazy question. <laughs> this is a great question. You mentioned that you were not sure if an older poem was still good. That suggests oh. you're changing attitude yeah, about I didn't what like you it make. When I read it. That suggests you're changing attitude about what you make and how you make it. How would yeah. you characterize the evolution of your work thus far? Um, I think. Well, you know, when I was reading that, I, I, I already, I know what's wrong with that poem. I was afraid to change it. I was afraid mm -hmm. to, I was, a, I was afraid to, um, you know, at the risk of discrediting <laughs> the earlier work, I think I didn't understand cadence the way that mm -hmm. I under, that I, way that I understand, or I should say it this way. I was thinking of it as cadence, not prosody. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't understand how to break it apart. So when I was reading that poem, I was like, I was, I was seeing like the places where 
it just was, um, I was relying on a kind of internal cadence that I didn't know how to, uh, to scan, frankly, you know what I mean? Like I, and actually that, that's a prose poem, which makes it even weirder. Um, so <laughs> I kind of want to like go back and try to rewrite it and see what would happen. Um, Cause I mean, you know, that's that, I think that's cadence is um, something that can, uh, spur a sort of it's it's a spontaneous thing right so there's something about it that's a little raw um a little you know in the rough kind of thing which could has a kind of beauty you know like i still appreciate the beauty of that but when i was reading it i was like no there's places that i my ear was like nope <laughs> you know what i mean and i know mm -hmm. better how to and that's just from from studying prosody you know um, so I guess I, I've, I'm trying to think more about line, more about um, prosody, and also more about compression um, and what I can do with uh, recur like recurrence versus repetition, I think is a lot mm -hmm. of what I think about. Um, and I think about that reading Shane's work a lot because there is, you know, it's one thing to repeat something. It's another thing to kind of return to it and sort of like, push it and break it apart, which I think Shane does a lot in his work. So um, yeah, I don't know. That, that's just one thing I was thinking about. There's a question for Shane. Um, what do you see as the relationship between the character of the hastily assembled angel and the first part of Sometimes I Know Ooh, I want to know this too. And Jim Limber in the second. I'm so glad somebody asked that. Who asked that? This is a question from Ellie. That's a good Ellie. question. Thank you, yeah, Ellie. Uh, I'm going to give you a disappointing answer, um, which is there's a way in which they kind of don't have a relationship, at least as I think about them as characters. Um, I mean, Jim Limber is in heaven, yes, but Jim Limber is a human being um, who lived in a certain period of time and has a view of eternity, sort of, but is became who he was in a certain stretch of years. Whereas the hastily assembled angel is pre-human, um, observes humanity, sort of falls in love with, or at least wants to be with people, um, and, but doesn't necessarily, isn't subject to time in the same way. And it occurred to me that I would might write a poem in which they meet each other, but then I thought that that would be too cute. Um, what they're doing, their relationship is rather that they are both, um, when you think about what their stories are, or what it is that they do, they are creating a way or working together to make a way to think about how uh, ideas of heaven operate and how one version of heaven might operate and what it really means, I guess, to sort of have I guess maybe the best way to say it is they create conditions in which one can think about what it means to really have faith. Um, mm. In America, and that's, you, you know, something terrible is going to be said when someone starts with in America. In America, we, we, particularly like in the 20th century, you know, there are ways in which America is a very religious country, but it's religious, um, I guess maybe very Christian even would be the way to say what I'm thinking about. But it's very Christian in this extremely shallow way. Um, it essentially wants um, God to sort of, you know, confirm everything that it wants to do and punish the people it doesn't like, um, which is, and in, in, in this book, the way the book sees heaven, the way the book sees God is you can kind of struggle against these sort of ultimate powers as much as you want. And that struggle can be important, but there is a point at which one must realize ultimate power means ultimate power. And how do you work with that? What does that mean? Uh, you know, whereas what America, Americans seem to have wanted for a long time is to essentially have power over um, deity, I guess. Um, which is a sort of, I mean, what that amount, what that ends up in is somebody like Donald Trump, 
um, that view of how power works in the world um, and this idea of sort of dominating um, all beings, including the being that one is supposed to worship, ends up with somebody like Donald Trump in the book. Um, even though there are a lot of ways in which it formulates a relationship to God that I think people might find a little unpleasant, um, and a relationship to angels a little unpleasant, because um, Jim Limber and angels don't really get along. Um, there is humility, the book seems to be saying, or at least I think it seems to be saying, that humility isn't a bad thing, and that mm. from humility, we can figure out how to teach each other or how to treat each other the right way, as opposed to this sort of idea of, you know, human beings being the ultimate source of, of power um, that just ends up with us treating each other terribly. And so I think that their relationship is that they formulate a space in which to think about what it means to have a degree of humility. I think it's a terrible answer, but I think it's maybe- That was a great to... answer. <sighs> There's a question um, for Francine. Um, your image work is always so arresting. Sometimes your images are relatable, representational, but other times they push the boundaries of sense and trouble meaning. Um, what well do you draw from to develop your imagery? The body? Do you just go with intuition? What feels right? What are you aiming to do with the image? Make us feel, make us understand? Who asked that? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. It's the poet, uh, Makalani Bendel. Oh, hi, Makalani. <laughs> Who also has a really beautiful book out right now that I blurbed. <laughs> um, about Bud Powell. I'm so glad you wrote that book, Makalani. Um, anyway. Um, uh, what, do, what do I, what am I, it sounds kind of like essentially what am I trying to do with the image and where does it come from? Where does that come from? What am I trying to do? I answered, I said, I said, so, I talked about this recently, but, um, you know, I'm a little bit obsessed with imagery, or at least I have been in the past. Um, and I think, you know, uh, image is like leftover impression. So in a way, it's like, sometimes I think of it as shock print, you know, like, uh, when things happen that kind of unsettle what you're, what you're left with is an image, almost like the way the camera works, you know, that kind of negative uh, impression. Um, and so I think you can do that in reverse. You can, if, if you're left with this kind of like um, really poignant um, stain of, a, of an event, then you can also like recreate a stain to kind of trigger an understanding, I think. Um, and I guess that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to recreate the, uh, the experience of, uh, experience. I'm trying to recreate experience in the opposite way. I don't know that I've ever thought about, talked about it that way before, but I think that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and that can take on a lot of form. So sometimes that it's, you know, working from an image that has been that I've been left with and other times it's trying to figure out kind of like the deep images where I was we're trying to figure out what kind of image um, what combination of things will trigger a, a kind of psychic connection I guess um, and you know there's just there's a multi there's so many there's an infinite number of combinations right <laughs> it's like playing with a combination lock in a way um, that can do that, you know, just on a, on a basic level. Um, I taught a class in imagery too, which was really fun because the whole idea was that we would start this semester thinking that we, we didn't know what an image was and then in the semester being sure of that. <laughs> and it kind of worked, you know, because, it, because the image can mean so many different things, you know. Um, we think we know what it means but then you wind up realizing that the way that you perceive the world is, is um, only partly anything. It's only partly visual, it's only partly perceptual, like the way that we absorb information um, happens on, on, through all of our senses, you know? So anyway. 
I think we have time for one more question and it's the last question we have um, it's for either poet. Um, and I will- Shane should answer it. Why did I lose it? Here it is. How would you say your poetic metaphysics informs your poetic ethics or vice versa? Or rather, which comes first for you, the cosmos building or the people behaving as they do? Dude. Who asked that question? These are crazy questions. These literati people. <laughs> yeah. Poetic metaphysics. Uh, okay. Uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, it depends. Um, there's a way in which, uh, if, if I'm writing about things that have happened or I imagine happening on the earth, then the world building is in some sense already there, um, in a very literal sense, I suppose. Um, and so uh, it becomes the ground upon which um, ethics are worked out. Um, but um, if I'm imagining a totally different world, a different space like heaven or hell or wherever, uh, then I would say that world building and metaphysics and ethics are sort of working together to make the poem, uh, to generate the poem as it is being written. Um, whereas I, if I'm writing about like the Kennedy assassination, I don't know what, then that is more arising out of ethics um, because I would have already brought, uh, there's already metaphysics there for me and I would have already brought my own. Um, so it just depends on the kind of poem that I'm writing, I guess. I mean, I think that's a huge question and I'm not quite sure how to answer it except that I know that ethics is always a problem and I try to console myself in that, you know, like, in fact, it's almost the basis of problem. Anytime there is problem, there's ethics involved. Um, even if it's to the point of negating all of the ethics, it still doesn't mean that they've gone anywhere. Um, so to me, it's like, I, it, there's no yes or no. It's just that ethics is always an issue. And sometimes, you know, when you're doing it the right way, you can sort of imagine that what you're writing is a way of, of maybe putting into action some of the things that you hope are possible. You know what I mean? That's it. That's my answer. That's, I mean, that's such a lovely and uplifting note to end on. Um, <laughs> so it's perfect. Um, thank you, Shane McCray. Thank you, Francine J. Harris for, for joining thank us. Thank you. It was so good to see you. Good to see you, Francine. I hope we can do so again uh, in person at the end of the pandemic. And Absolutely. We can have you totally. both to the bookstore sometime soon. Um, Thank you for reading with me, Shane. Thank you for reading with me. My gosh, it's great. <laughs> Thank you all of you for joining us this evening. Um, and uh, we'll see you at the next event. Until then, continue to stay safe and be well. Take care. Bye all. Bye, Bye. everybody.